Blog Talk Radio. Radio, and today we have guest co-host Tim Williams, who is an ordained minister through the United Christian Fellowship Church in Porterville, and he is an awesome musician. He is responsible for all the instruments in that song you just heard. Tonight we're talking about the Zeitgeist movie, fact or fiction. The Zeitgeist movie tries to undermine Christianity by claiming that uh, the Jesus of the Bible is not a real historical person, and in fact, he never existed. Instead, Jesus is an invention of the biblical authors who painstakingly copied attributes of ancient pagan deities and created a new god to be worshipped. They say that Jesus mirrors various pagan deities in the manner of his birth, life, and death, as well as his resurrection. So, Tim, why don't you start us off on this whole Zeitgeist uh, movie. Was Jesus a mythological person, or was he real? Well, uh, I certainly believe he was real. Out of all the ones that mentioned, and we'll probably go through a list later, uh, we know uh, that, I mean, there's physical evidence that Jesus walked the earth. The the documentation on his physical birth and life and death and resurrection are indisputable. I mean, I don't, you know, I don't know how anybody can want to deceive themselves to the point of saying he didn't exist. We have historians that were not Christians or Jews writing of his life and the occurrence of his life, uh, Without any link to the Bible, they just recorded his existence. Uh, what are some of the names? Mithra, Dionysus, uh, Apis, and uh, what, the Hindu one, Krishna. Mm-hmm. You can't find any physical evidence of their life on earth. And they're they're known as myths. I mean, there's no physical evidence that they existed at all. They're actual myths. Whereas Jesus was documented by four actual historians. He was documented yeah. by, uh, who is it, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and, Matthew, Mark, John, Matthew Mark, John, yeah. in the Gospels, and um, several non-historians. Uh, There's lots of documentation that Jesus existed. And one of the strongest arguments I heard to uh, to show that Jesus did exist was that if... Um, if it was possible to claim that he was a myth, they would have done it well before the 17th century because, yeah. um, you know, people after uh, Christ was crucified and resurrected and started becoming Christians, you know, the Romans wanted them dead and the Jews didn't believe Christ was the Messiah, so they didn't believe it. So what easier way to dispel the idea of Christianity than to to bring to light the supposed fact that Jesus was just a myth. But they couldn't do it then because he walked the earth the same time they did, so they can't claim he's a myth. So that's one of the strongest arguments for the existence of Jesus, just the fact that they didn't start attempting to deny his existence until 1700 A.D. Yeah, uh, and it was because... Basically, the form of Christianity uh, encourages you to stand up and be a free-thinking person. You know, God uh, encourages free will and choice. You know, 
the God of the Bible is the only religion where he doesn't come in and force you to do anything. Uh, we have uh, the Muslims, which we're not talking about today. They'll cut your head off if you don't believe. Uh, Mithra was one that would kill you if you didn't believe. Now, Krishna, you had a few more chances because they have, uh, what do they call it, reincarnation, but you might come back as a flea or a bug or something. Uh, you know, all the rest of them uh, were uh, violent. You'll die if you don't believe. Uh, I think uh, I was reading about Dionysus. Uh, there was a big war where he seduced a lot of women, and there again, uh, Christianity doesn't seduce anybody. It gives you a chance to choose. But he seduces a bunch of women, and uh, then he's persecuted by one of the other gods, and then he goes to war uh, to kill all the women that don't believe in him. Nothing like Christianity. It's the only religion on earth that is a religion of peace and free choice. Yeah. Yeah, you know, one of the central claims in the Zeitgeist movie about Horus being the original son of the father is that he's the sun god. And in yeah. actuality, Ra is the sun god. Horus is the god of the sky, the sky god. And um, uh, he was also uh, known as the, the falcon god, whose name means the far-off one. Yeah, so right. Ra was the sun god who came to be identified right. with midday sun. And in addition, Horus was also right. an injured right. eye. He had like an injured eye, which was the moon, and his good eye was the sun or something like that. And one of the funniest things about what they say about Horus was they claimed that he walked on water, right? Well, when questioned about this, her name was Asheriah S., that's her pen name. I forget what her real name is. But she says, yeah. well, you know, Horus being the sun god, the sun reflects off of the water, so that is like walking on water. So that that's what they mean when they say Horus walked on water. They just mean that the sun reflects off of water. Well, cool. And I can look like, into a still pond and see my face and tell everybody I walk on water. <laughs> yeah. Right, crazy, and and the fact that, that you know they're they're making this correlation between all these gods being born on December twenty fifth, and Christ was not born on December twenty fifth. You know right. that was a that was a pagan holiday uh, designed to worship the sun god that I believe it was em Emperor Constantine decided that they would celebrate. Jesus Christ's birthday on that pagan holiday. So it's just kind of a ploy to dupe people into celebrating the sun god uh, by telling them that that was Jesus' birthday, or at least that that's the day they were going to celebrate as Jesus' birthday. Nobody seems to know when Jesus was born. Uh, somewhere, some say in June, others say in like October. Do you know when Jesus um, was born? or? I just heard somebody speaking about that about a month ago, and again, it was Rabbi uh, uh, Jonathan Kahn, and this guy, is, his knowledge is just expanding and expanding. The Lord is showing stuff. But the reality of it, the, uh, we're pretty sure he was born at the same time he died, at Passover. In other words, the Passover lamb was born on Passover, died on Passover, uh, for one thing, uh, I can only cite a few of the, uh, the facts, but uh, it said the shepherds were out watching their sheep. Well, the thing is, they didn't sit out and watch their sheep in wintertime. Uh, they were corralled. They were pinned up. They weren't out watching them in the wintertime. And then it, it also mentions, and I don't have the literature in front of me, but it mentions uh, the, the particular festival and that was just shortly before Passover. So uh, we're coming down to we're more and more sure that he was born the same time that he died. Now, he came in as the Passover lamb, the blood on the doorpost that brings uh, uh, redemption, and uh, died as the Passover lamb. Hmm. 
I see. Um, another one of the claims is that uh, Horus was born of a virgin named Mary. And um, first of all, uh, there are hieroglyphs, uh, Egyptian hieroglyphs, showing the act of sexual intercourse in the creation of Horus. So they have actual physical hieroglyphs documenting that Horus was, you know, in the mythological realm anyway, created through a sexual act and not actually born of a virgin. So, But ignoring that fact, so where does Mary come in? The word Mary, M-E-R-I, was a prefix added to any god to indicate uh, the term beloved. Mary in, um, I guess it was Greek or whatever, um, means beloved. So when they say that Horus was born of Mary, they're they're saying, well, Horus was born of a god, which was yeah. Mary or beloved, because they called yeah, all of their gods beloved. So it didn't matter which god he was born of, they were all beloved and therefore all Mary. So that's that a, that a brings huge up story. another point. All all of the stories. Uh, whether Mithras or 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 uh, Horus or Dionys, Dionysus, any of those, you can find several stories of their origin. They don't all match. You can only find one about Jesus, other than the people now that are making up, uh, you know, falsehoods about it. But you you can only find one, and it's you know the Bible is the most documented, the most proven book has the most original uh, manuscripts found. The only book that comes in second to that, I think, is uh, Homer's Iliad. And then all other books, like ancient books, you can find very few uh, existing documents that are reliable. The Bible is heavily documented, and you have one story, uh, whether it's, well, I think uh, Zeitgeist has uh, uh, the Hindu god, uh, uh, Krishna and Attis, Mithra, Dionysus, I can't remember who else, but, you know, it's just crazy that they would make up birth dates. And, and again, most of the literature showing the birth dates, uh, uh, you know, of, of December 25th, born of a virgin, and, and they just parallel exactly what Jesus did. All that documentation goes back to maybe five, six hundred years to a thousand years after Christ was born. So all of a sudden these stories pop up. And part of that, the December 25th, uh, I know I read one article where Mithras, you find a lot of uh, Mithric art in some ancient churches. Well, again, uh, you mentioned at the Roman Catholic Church, they would pull these people in and say, "Okay, yeah, that's cool. We'll use some of your uh, some of your ideas here, and we'll tell you that that symbolizes this and and, and that in Christianity." And that's where the December twenty fifth came in. Is all of those characters? Uh, I think other than the Hindu god are, are sun gods. Well, December twenty fifth is a, a winter solstice. So when the sun was at the lowest, you'd think they would have done the summer solstice, but uh, they just picked that date out of Mithraism, but it wasn't when the god was born. It's just when they had their high form of worship. Right. You know, another um, argument that the Zeitgeist movement or the Zeitgeist movie uses to uh, dispel the existence of Jesus is they claim that because he was only documented by four historians, and one of them was proven to be a forgery. Now, the four historians are uh, Liney the Younger, Suetonius, Tacitus, and Josephus. Now, yeah. Josephus is the one that they claimed was a forgery, and I found the documentation about that forgery, and um, it comes from the uh, quote from Antiquities uh, 18, and it goes like this, quote, At this time there was a wise man who was called Jesus, and his conduct was good, and he was known to be virtuous. 
and many people from among the Jews and other nations became his disciples. Pilate condemned him to be crucified and die, and those who had become his disciples did not abandon their loyalty to him. They reported that he appeared to them three days after his crucifixion and that he was alive. Accordingly, they believed that he was the Messiah, concerning whom the prophets have recounted wonders. Now, the uh, the thing that they're saying is the reason why they say this um, document was a forgery is that they found four copies of it. And in uh, two of the copies, the words they reported that, when it says they reported that he had appeared to them three days after his crucifixion, uh, two of those uh, stone plates, it did not say those three words. They reported that. And also, accordingly, they believed that. Those those um, four words were missing as well. So, in other words, it read, rather than they reported that, it read, he had appeared to them three days after his crucifixion, stated as fact. And the problem with this is Josephus was not a Christian and did not want to believe that Christ was the Messiah. Um, so, at any rate, the the likelihood that the forgery in the first passage was in the erasing of words and not in the addition of words. At any rate, the the fact is, those stone plates do exist. Josephus did state that Jesus existed. Their argument is that Jesus didn't exist. And the only um, discrepancy with respect to those passages, those documents, is whether they believed Christ was the Messiah or they stated that he was the Messiah. There was no question as to whether he existed or not. He definitely existed, according to that document, or those stone plates. Right, and Josephus is, I mean, he's a documented and approved historian, Uh Scholars, whether they're biblical or whatever they're looking for, accept him a, a, as a bona fide, qualified source for, for many different subjects. He was well-known, well-documented, and to nitpick over a couple things, and, and to my mind, okay, a stone tablet, if, if, if you're calling it a forgery because somebody came along and chiseled out some words, I mean, if you wrote a stone tablet letter, and I wanted to disprove you, it wouldn't be a forgery if I came along and messed it up. It would be corrupt in that one sense, but it wouldn't be a forgery. That doesn't prove that it's a forgery. It proves somebody tampered with it. Right. Doesn't it? Okay. Yeah. Um, I found the, uh, li- the other list of non-biblical references to Jesus. Uh, the list is uh, Cornelius, Tacitus, Gaius, Suetonius, Tranquillus, uh, Phallus, Liney the Younger, Celsus, Lucian of Samosata, Mara Bar, Serapion, Flavius Joseph, the Babylonian Talmud, Clement of Rome, Ignatius of Antioch, Quadratus of Athens, uh, Aristides of Anthion, and Higasippus. Boy, those are some difficult names to pronounce. But yeah, there's a whole slew of authors who cited Jesus and uh, certainly were not citing some mythological being. So anyway, I think we pretty much established that uh, Christ was not a myth. In fact, even um, one of the atheists, uh, this guy, the Michael Grant, he's an atheist historian, uh, he uh-huh. states that um, a quote from Michael Grant, the atheist historian, goes like this. It says, uh, modern critical methods fail to support the Christ myth theory. It has again and again been answered and annihilated by first rank scholars. In recent years, no serious scholar has ventured to postulate the non-historicity view of Jesus, or at any rate, very few. And they have not 
succeeded in disposing of the much stronger, indeed very abundant evidence to the contrary. So he's saying that any serious historian would not claim that Christ was a myth. So I think we pretty right. much established that Christ existed. So my question is, what is the objective behind the Zeitgeist movie in attempting to dispel the Christ uh, fact, the fact that Christ existed? Why, why would they want everybody to think he's a myth? Well, you know, for one thing, I, I was uh, reading some stuff. Uh, uh, Peter Joseph, who created the movie, he says about himself, he said, I was a born-again Christian, but it took me a lot of years to become a good atheist. And uh, uh, one of the things with Christ is people come with a wrong idea and somehow they, they're they not able to give themselves to the Lord, they're not able to trust him, so they deny him. And then they spend all their time trying to, you know, uh, attack and say it's wrong. And it's almost like the uh, the uh, uh, the sour grape story where the young fox is trying to jump up and grab grapes, and he jumps and he he can't get them. So finally he stomps away and says, "I didn't want those in the first place. They're probably sour." But there's something that I've looked at over the years, and some of the most dangerous and destructive people in history have been people that tried to come to the Lord and for some reason just, you know, uh, didn't come with their heart, came with their mind, and, and really could not perceive what he was talking about and have turned away and, and in doing so just become vehement about turning everybody else away. And some of those people include Adolf Hitler, who uh, aspired early in his life to become, he wanted to be Pope. And he couldn't do that, so he decided to become God himself and, you know, rule over people with life and death. Uh, uh, the guy that uh, basically uh, instituted uh, Russian communism, uh, uh, Lenin, Vladimir Lenin, I believe is his name. Again, a man born uh, uh, missionary parents, tried to uh, serve the Lord, somehow fell away, missed it, and decided to write his own Bible of communism. Here's here's how it ought to really be done. And, uh, uh, you know, it's that disappointment in God, and, you know, I have no idea why, how people miss that. He, he's never let me down, but uh, uh, that's the first reason. The other part is, and we've talked about this before, men do not inherently like the idea of somebody stronger and smarter. We're competitive. We want to be the top dog. And the idea of this God that, you know, has control over our lives and is bigger than us, you know, uh, what you know what's the joke women are always making, that men don't like to stop and, and get directions? You know, I'm just going to go on and do it myself. And it's, uh, it's just an inherent physical uh, uh, attribute. Uh, of uh, of the man's humankind's mind to I'm going to do it myself you know I I I want to be the leader I want to be the top dog and that that's the only reference I have for that question uh, when I read about Peter Joseph the guy who wrote and directed um, the Zeitgeist movie is that he also in 2013 directed the Black Sabbath movie, music video. God is dead. So he's obviously not a big promoter of God or Jesus. So, you know, it, it, I mean, if you're going to write and direct a Black Sabbath movie video called God is Dead, I'm thinking that, you know, either you're a Satanist or a definite atheist um so he, he just he he wants to dispel the idea of God, period. Right, right. Um, yeah. Another author uh, that started out to be uh, a minister got sick, and because he got sick, he actually was in the navy. He thought he was going to have a 
a uh, career in the Navy, and because of his illness, got thrown out of the Navy, and that just frustrated him. And uh, he started writing, but he had a minor as as a, uh, a theologian. And you can go through his writing, and he starts writing about God. He ends up writing science fiction, and he has wrote some of the main movies that give us most of the ideas that we have now. Uh, and we've talked a lot about aliens, space travel, alien invasion. Uh, it's through him, Robert Heinlein, that we have most of the ideas about aliens and, and uh, ETs and uh, UFOs uh, promoted that heavy. And it, it, I find it interesting. He gets disappointed with the Lord because his career didn't quite go like he wanted and turns it into this thing of it, the last book he wrote before he died, uh, I, I think the, the name of it was Job. I mean, he spends two-thirds of the book just blaspheming God, just I mean, I could see him foaming at the mouth and just his hatred for the Lord. And in his case, all because he got sick and didn't couldn't pursue the particular career that he wanted to. Yet he went on to become extremely rich in the in the career that he ended up in. <laughs> huh. Yeah, yeah. One of the um, one of the strongest arguments against God that I've heard is the fact that there's so much evil on the planet. And I heard a really good um, uh, debate about that today. You know what the butterfly effect is? Like a, a right. butterfly uh-huh. wing. The the little teeny bit of wind that comes the butterfly's wing can create a cascade of events that leads to a hurricane halfway around the globe. And, uh, right. you know, we've got to take our little break here. I'm going to go ahead and play... Uh, your song, uh, Walking in the Sun, and then we're going to be back so you can listen to in the archives section. But this is it for the live version of the show, and we thank you for tuning in.
Welcome back to Vision for Humanity Radio. This is Samuel D. Moore, Tim Williams, Craig, and Jim. And we're talking about the Zeitgeist movie, Fact or Fiction. And when we left off, I was stating that one of the best arguments against God, I feel, is the existence of evil in the world. And I was relating that to a concept known as the butterfly effect, whereby the the little teeny bit of wind that comes off the wing of a butterfly can have a cascading effect that causes a hurricane halfway around the world. And so the principle here is that evil is on the world to teach us something. Like if you come across somebody who, like for example, the other day, um, I did an eye exam on a woman who had a son who committed suicide three months prior. And she also had uh, multiple sclerosis and some gastrointestinal problems. And the daughter looked anorexic. I did her exam, too. And she was, like, shaking and nervous and probably malnourished. And it was just really, really sad. And I thought, you know, um, like other people think, why would God do this to them? And the argument that I was told was that, um, you know, although that person is suffering in this lifetime, this lifetime is just a blink of the eye in terms of the grand scheme of things in eternity. You know, um, as humans, we're put on this earth for about 100 years, and we tend to think that, you know, God put us here so we would be happy. But he put us here so we would learn something, not just to make us happy. What do you think about all this, Tim? Well, that's, you know, a subject. uh, All church has great, great debates over that. Uh, uh, You know, I guess I could teach you about pain by breaking your arm, but that wouldn't be very godly, would it? So I I have trouble picturing God, you know, everybody, I've seen parents, you know, in in a, a store and their kid is whining and crying and they reach over and slap the little sucker or shake him and go, you don't shut up, I'll give you something to cry about. Well, that's human nature. Uh, I, I can't see a God that's going to cause you to suffer to learn something. Uh, basically, suffering is going to teach us, A, we did something wrong, or B, guess what? There is evil in the world. Sickness didn't come from God. He didn't put sickness on anybody. Uh, we see that uh, in Job where he allowed Satan to put some sickness on a man as a test. He admits it. In uh, Isaiah 53, he said, I made the tempter to test you. Now, testing and chastisement isn't punishment. It's a test. Now, uh, evil has existed since the fall in the garden. So if somebody's sick, God didn't do that. And since that time until now, he's given us powers and the ability through prayer and his word to combat that. But guess what, Uh, Sam? Most of the church doesn't actually believe it. And I believe... That's where we fall into that trap of what I talked about, people that get disappointed with God. They come in and they think, well, God's this good guy. He's going to heal all my problems. He's going to fix everything. He's going to give me this big, rosy life. And like you just said a minute ago, uh, he's supposed to make me happy. Well, I think that's Obama thinks that promises all that. But it's not true there either. Promises to make you whole. And you have a relationship with God. He works on you as far as you let him. I have a relationship with God. He works on me as far as I let him. And he doesn't change people to please me. Uh, you know what I mean? He allows me to work in his word to start rectifying some of my problems. And, uh, I don't know. Do you, do you see where I'm going with this? Yeah, there's evil in the world. But that's because people chose to be evil. There's sickness in the world because, and this isn't your fault or mine. Adam and Eve 
chose to disbelieve God. They allowed something to come in and, and start working. Their firstborn son went along with it. He killed his brother because he didn't get what he wanted. And, and you know, no, nobody can explain why there's evil or, how, you know, how it all works. But it's here. And that's what we're dealing with. It's a test, but it, God doesn't torture us to teach us anything. I mean, we already know. Do you know that evil is evil and is bad? Yeah. <laughs> Nobody has to teach you that. What we're learning is how to overcome that. And what Jesus says is we overcome evil with good. So we're just learning to have those good intentions. I know you like that phrase. We're having these, you know, these good a good way of behaving and a proper way of approaching these situations to where we can learn to overcome them. Does that make yeah. sense to you? Well, yeah, yeah, it does. It totally does. What I was kind of thinking when I when I was sitting, talking about the butterfly effect is when people are put on this earth who have to suffer, if you think of the whole group of us as one unit, like there's a theory in biology called the geos theory, where the entire planet and all of the organisms on it are one living organism. We are all one. And I believe it talks about a similar concept in the Bible, that we're all connected. And so when we come across somebody who's suffering, it teaches us to have compassion and to have charity and to go out of our way to try to make their poor suffering lives better somehow. And it gives us emotions that we may not have otherwise had. So if you go through life and your entire life is a beach party and all you experience is, you know, beach balls and surfing and laying in the sun and drinking Mai Tais, then how much are you going to learn? You know, you're not going to learn about compassion and um, caring and charity and um, long-suffering. You're just going to learn about fun. And so I, I think God puts us through these situations to teach us something. And I kind of think of it like this. Okay, so you know how the military is um, is pretty high-tech now. Well, and wait, let me stop you, know, you there because the, the one phrase, God puts it there for us to learn. It's there. It was the fall of man. We're letting sin in. God didn't put it there. God didn't make you sick to show me how to be nice to you. You know what I mean? That that that's where I, I'm almost always going to disagree with you. I don't. That's where people get this. I think thrown off. They point at God and say, "Well, He did this." No, 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 no. If you read the Bible, it says the God of this world is Satan. Now that God made somebody crippled. That God corrupted a gene to where they were, you know, had a, a disformity. That God, and I will not call him God and give him credit for anything in my life other than evil. The God of the Bible, our God the Father, he only does good. It's it's the war where it got corrupted, and Adam gave Satan that title to be the God of this world. Do you understand what I'm saying? I just, I I just... Yeah, yeah, it's it's kind of like my argument with, Remember that song, God is Everything, by David Hubby yeah. Bardowell? Yeah. Um, yeah God is song. love, God is everything. Um, uh-huh. Well, that song, I argued, is technically incorrect. Because in the Bible, it says that God is love. And my argument yeah. was that there's the devil, and then there's God. And You're God right. is not the devil, and the devil is not God. So God really is not everything. the evil stuff. God is God not the evil. He's all not the, the good stuff. Yeah. But if you just listen to my argument, just just you know, for something to think about. Okay, so yeah. take the analogy of uh, playing video games or virtual reality games in uh, a training mission. Say say you're um, signing up for the Army or the Air Force, and your job is going to be to fly drones and drive high-tech computerized equipment, and they want to know how good you are. So they put you in a a simulated environment with a video game, 
and they give you controls that are the actual controls that you will be using in actual warfare, but what you're really doing is just a video game. You know, so right. you've got as many lives as you can lose, no big deal, but your goal is to get through that video game without losing any lives or with losing as few lives as possible. So you right. you go to the recruiter's office, you sit down at the little uh, console there, you get you see all the you little knobs and buttons and gadgets, and you go through this video game, and um, you you uh, you fail, and somebody else who's more talented than you or learns quicker, you know, they get through it, and so that person gets sent off to war, where they have a much better chance of surviving than you would have had you been sent off to war. So it's kind of a proving ground. You know, I think the the life on Earth is just a precursor of things to come. I don't think it's the be all and end all. I, I think that once we get to heaven, we're going to be uh, opened up to a whole new realm, and we'll look back on our life on Earth and say, oh, that's why we were there. We were there to learn, and all this suffering and stuff that I had to go through, that was just a learning experience. And, and although it was bad then, that was just, you know, a drop in the bucket, a blink in the eye. Now I'm in eternity, and that little bit of suffering that I experienced was, in retrospect, absolutely nothing. I mean, we think about suffering on Earth these days as really horrible, but I think in the grand scheme of things, once we get to heaven, it's going to be, in retrospect, not that big of a deal. But that's kind of my message. Um, that's what I think. But at least it's a, well, one of the, the Bible agrees. There are scriptures to back that up, so... I think we're just yeah. about out of time. But yeah, the Bible. There it go. Yeah. Okay. Hey, well, I think that's it for today. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll join you next time, same time, Friday nights at 8.30 p.m. Your peace when it steals my